Do you guys remember the Mighty Ducks? No, 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 no. Not that Mighty Ducks. I'm talking about the Disney Channel animated cartoon series, The Mighty Ducks. I'm not going to lie, there was a long while where I wasn't even sure this show had really existed. Like, part of me was convinced it was some kind of really elaborate fever dream. And honestly, can you blame me? I mean, look at this. It's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles meets Howard the Ducks meets the super confusing idea of it being given the same name as one decent movie and a whole load of terrible sequels. But is this show all that it's quacked up to be? If I had hands, I would slap you for that. That would probably be fair. Mighty Ducks, the animated series, began in the fall of 1996 on ABC's Disney Afternoon and had a 26 episode run. According to the Wikipedia article, the show was inspired by and loosely based on the live action films. I mean, yeah, no, I, I can totally see the resemblance here. Still better than Mighty Ducks 3, though. The story, believe it or not, takes place a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. No, 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 no. We are already tempting the YouTube bots enough by just talking about Disney in the first place. The team's manager is explaining where the giant ducks come from to the only guy who's apparently worked up about them, a police officer called Captain Cleghorn. The story starts on a planet called Puck World, admittedly, I'm glad it's not Duck World, and are introduced to some of our main characters, Wild Wing Flashblade, his brother Nosedive, and Canard Thunderbeak. Collect all three today! They're playing hockey because apparently their entire society is hockey based. Okay. Nosedive just so happens to be telling them the story of the legendary Drake Duquesne and his high-tech goalie mask, which allowed him to see the invisible Saurian overlords and save Puckworld from their dark rule. Meh, I've heard dumber. I get sci-fi after all. Wildwing and Nosedive aren't quite buying the story, though. Relax, baby brother. The Saurian Empire vanished centuries ago. Well, I guess if you say so, that settles it. Oh, there they are. What a shock. Here we meet our main villains, the last of the Saurian Empire. The big guy is called Siege and is voiced by Mr. Krabs, or Clancy Brown. The shape-shifting guy is, creatively enough, called Chameleon, and the Dime Store Skeletor is named Rain. And that's why the Disney creative team gets paid the big bucks. Wraith is voiced by one of the greatest sinister voice actors in the world, Tony Jade, the voice of Frollo in Hunchback of Notre Dame. This is a mistake, Lord Dragonus. If we do not use the dark powers of our ancestors, I predict a dismal outcome. Like fire, hellfire, this fire in my skin. They're led by this dragon-looking guy who, of course, is called Lord Dragonus, voiced by the greatest hammy villain voice this world will ever know, Tim Curry. And technology will crush Puck World flat! I'm just a sweet transvestite from transsexual Transylvania. So yeah, they've got some really decent actors as the villains. It's just too bad the characters themselves are pretty stock. Wait, no, I didn't mean- Hello everybody, Stock Stockerson here with Stock Stockerson Stock Character Warehouse and Emporium right here today to bring you up on our newest villain special. Bundle one dumb muscle character with one old wise man and one character with novelty power to get our villain supergroup discount. Remember, if it requires any kind of creative process, it ain't stock. The big guy is stupid, the old guy is constantly going on about something something dark side, and Chameleon is just your standard little slime ball mixed with the most annoying bits of Genie from Aladdin. How does he know who Groucho Marx is? Anyway, Dragonus invades, immediately taking over Puck World with basically no resistance. Well, okay, Kennard has gotten a group of freedom fighters together, and we're given a hilariously brief introduction into our other main characters. Let me save us some time, though. We've got female Donatello, Xena Warrior Princess, Zoro, and Toru. Ten points to whoever gets this reference. Anyway, Kennard has found the legendary mask of Drake Duquesne, because of course he has, and they go on the offensive against Dragonus. Why the giant robots don't just shoot the jet down, I have no idea. 
Their plan is to destroy the command center and jump Dragonus, but bottom line, things go duck tits up, Dragonus tries to escape into... SPACE! into another dimension through the Doctor Who time vortex, Kennard has to sacrifice himself because... reasons, and gives the mask to Wildwing, as well as command of the team. Wouldn't you know it, the exit of the transdimensional portal takes the ducks to our Earth. You think the guy had never seen a duck before? Have you seen humans before? Well, it's decided that they need to play hockey somewhere because... We don't even know where Dragonus is. We gotta play hockey to keep our edge. Sure, that, whatever that means. And luckily for them, there's a largely disused rink within walking distance, which is where we meet the future team manager, Phil Palmfeather, voiced by Jim Belushi, who is strangely unperturbed by the fact that he's talking to giant ducks. Well, the rest of the world doesn't seem that perturbed either, and after beating what I can only describe as the monsters of hockey, the ducks quickly become a national sensation. Funnily, I thought their existence would have been an interest to the government, or military, or maybe science, but whatever, fine, they play hockey. They use their proceeds from playing hockey to build a base and develop a new line of weaponry. Seriously, no military interest whatsoever. Okay. They go on the hunt for Dragonus, but Zoro, sorry, Duke, insists that they fight crime. Hey, I've been on the wrong side of the law. And if we don't fight evil wherever we find it, we're no better than Dragonus himself. And this brings up a question that you'll more than likely be asking yourself a whole lot through these first couple episodes. Why isn't Duke Lorange the leader? He saves the others all the time, has way more leadership skills than Wild Wing, and is frankly more heroic in general, at least in the first episodes. I get that Wild Wing has a character to go through to find self-confidence and all, but he was just recruited to the Freedom Fighters, like, yesterday. This guy is getting promoted faster than James Kirk. Despite looking for an invisible enemy, which is their only way home and only chance of rescuing Kennard, Wildwing refuses to use Drake Duquesne's mask, saying that... Just keeping it until we find Kennard. You know what might help finding Kennard? The, uh, trans-dimensional gateway generator. Which is on Dragonus' ship which you can't find because you refuse to use the one mask that lets you see it. Well, despite Wildwing's incompetence, they eventually manage to find the ship. They quickly meet with resistance, however. And why the villains don't just always use their invisibility cloaks, since at best only Wildwing or whoever has the mask could see through it anyway, I couldn't tell you. Since Dragonus, you know, isn't an idiot, he attacks while invisible. Wildwing finally gets a clue and puts on the mask, but the ship's already in range to bombard the city. Fortunately, girl Donatello has a plan. Unfortunately, Toru has a different one, and the ship's main engine is destroyed. The problem is kinda glanced over, however, and the ducks just sort of... escape. They officially name Wildwing their leader, however, we see at the last minute that Dragonus' menace might not be quite ended after all. And that brings us to the end of our first story arc. What is this show like in general? Well, you're not going to believe that I'm going to say this, but it actually wasn't half bad. Okay, it was filled with stock cutouts of characters and villains. Okay, it was clearly a TMNT ripoff. And okay, it was a completely ridiculous concept. But here's the thing. Mighty Ducks the Animated Series was a show that, despite its premise, found a fairly decent balance between being humorous and taking itself actually pretty seriously. And when the show takes itself seriously, it lets us take it seriously, too. While the lame duck puns are numerous, they usually don't get in the way of the action or the story. And I'll admit the story has holes, and some pretty major things are glanced over, but for the most part, they're not things that the target audience, i.e. children, would really care that much about. I can't say I'm super surprised that this show didn't have a longer run, especially if it was being compared to shows like Gargoyles, but for what it was, it could have been a whole lot worse. At the end of the day, Mighty Ducks was a show that knew exactly what it was, and didn't waste time trying to be anything else, be that for good or for bad. That's all I've got for you this episode. I'll see you next time. Ducks are acceptable!
everybody, Stock Stockerson here with Stock Stockerson Stock Character Warehouse and Emporium, and I'm here today to bring you up on up to date on a special on villain sales. And I've already screwed up this so much that I'm never going to use it, so I might as well go back here and try it again.